Good morning. Happy Sabbath. It's good to see all of you here today, and I know that we have always have someone watching online, and so we uh, want to extend warm welcome to those that are joining us online uh, this morning as well. We typically have a significant passive vocabulary. That is, we know what the words mean, but those are words sometime in our passive vocabulary that we seldom use. And uh, one of those passive words, or some sort of semi-passive, I guess, is the word ponder. How many of you ever used ponder this week? Use that word. Oh, we have Connie here. She did excellent. About the only time I use the word ponder is when we sing the very first song in their church hymnal. And it uh, says, ponder anew what the Almighty can do. And so ponder, though, I want us to think about that word for just a moment. Ponder is a verb that means to think about something carefully, especially before making a decision or reaching a conclusion. And so today, as we go through our sermon, I want you to what? Ponder those texts. I want you to think about them. The, the uh, text that we had today and our subject is something I've been pondering for quite some time. And I, believe it or not, I am still pondering these texts. And so they're very, uh, very heavy texts. When I say heavy, I mean uh, just full of meaning. It's just hard to grasp some things. You know, when we think about the things of God, can you grasp God? You know, a God that can speak worlds into existence and all creation into existence that is the source of life. I, it's hard for me to comprehend that. It's hard for me to comprehend the distance to the uh, nearest star outside of our solar system, which is, I think, about 4.3 light years away. Light years traveling 186,000, I think it's 232 miles per second. Going for four years. It's hard for me to imagine things like that. It's hard for me to imagine God. And so we're thinking about, we're studying about today godly things, which really requires us to think, think with all of our intellect about what God is talking to us about. The soul temple. If you Google the phrase soul temple, you will come up with some pretty weird stuff. Believe it or not, the top phrase or top search of the phrase soul temple is a video game. Next, there is another search. Or the second thing that comes up is soul temple music. And next is a Facebook page called soul temple which advertises, listen to this, where we can connect with our truest essence and bring that into the world in order to create impactful change for ourselves and others. I don't know about that. But today our subject is Soul Temple, and it does not have anything to do with these Google searches, I assure you. But we're going to study what the Bible says about the Soul Temple. I'm going to ask you some questions today, a little interaction here. How many times do you think the term soul temple occurs in the New King James Version of the Bible? Because sometimes words will occur in a different version of the Bible, so I'm picking New King James Version. How many of you think that the term soul temple occurs 20 times in the... In the anyone think 10 times? Are you not just not voting or what now? <laughs> How about one time? How about none times? Oh, we got some smart people here. If you guess none, you would be right. But then you would be wrong at the same time. You'd be wrong, but you'd be right. Does that make sense? 
Well, I'll explain that. You see, sometimes things in the Bible use different terminology. For example, the word millennium that we, you know, we study that a lot in our Bible studies and sermons. And everybody knows what the millennium is, right? How many times does that occur in the Bible? Zero. The word millennium is not in the Bible. But the term thousand years is, and those terms are synonymous. And so we have to broaden our minds somewhat in looking at terminology that's in the Bible versus, and it means the same thing. For example, again, millennium means a thousand years. A sermon that I did uh, several months ago was uh, titled Attitude, and we discovered in that sermon that the word attitude was not in the Bible. But the attitude was in the Bible because there's many attitudes that are in the Bible that are, are displayed. And if you look at the Amplified Bible, you, you, some of those show up as well. And then we had another uh, topic called oneness. Remember that? Have y'all used the word oneness since we had that ser sermon? I'm disappointed. Oh, Connie did. Connie's my star pupil today. <laughs> But oneness is not in the Bible. Yet yeah, it is in the Bible because there's many, many instances where God says that he wants to be one with us. And so the concept of oneness is in the Bible, even though the word is not there. And so we're going to be talking about the soul temple today, which is not in the Bible, but it's in the Bible. Okay? We understand that. Okay, it's important. But before we get into Soul Temple, we need to do a little bit of background today to uh, flesh our subject out. When Jesus was on earth and when he preached to the crowds, and sometimes there were thousands of people there, he would preach to them and Jesus was speaking on this level and the crowds were thinking on this level. That is, they really didn't comprehend what Jesus was saying. Jesus often taught uh, through the use of parables. When, you, when Jesus taught about parables, people had to think about it, what it meant. They had to ponder uh, what something that Jesus was saying, in other words. They had to think about it and apply that parable to everyday living. Jesus taught about spiritual things, and the people often thought about literal things. That is, Jesus was speaking about spiritual things. Spiritual is the ultimate way of thinking about things. And literal things are very simple things. And so people were thinking simply. Jesus was uh, thinking exponentially, spiritually, high-level things. And so, in our first uh, slide today, we have a text from John 6, 54. It says, whoever eats, or Jesus is speaking here now, and I want you to keep in mind his mentality, spiritual things. I want you to keep in mind the people that were listening, their attitude, their mentality. Jesus says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. What was the reaction of the people? They said, yeah, I'm not going to eat anyone's flesh. I'm not going to drink their blood because blood was, especially to a Jew, was, you know, kosher. Blood is something that even if you ate meat, all the blood was supposed to be gone. You know, you're supposed to have some fiber there. <laughs> That's the only thing that was left. And so that they, they couldn't understand it. But Jesus would explain these things to people when they'd ask him. I mean, like the disciples, they'd come to him after the meeting was over. They'd say, what were you talking about here? <laughs> And so Jesus would explain to them that he was the living bread and, and that he was also the living waters. And, and so you have to read the rest of the scriptures, you know, all the other stories, and they explain what he was talking about here. A second example is Jesus' conversation with a man called Nicodemus. Nicodemus. John 3.3. 3. Jesus answered and said to him, that is, he was talking to Nicodemus in the evening there. He says, most assuredly, I say to you, and Jesus is talking up here, Nicodemus is down here. Jesus says, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. 
What did Nicodemus do? He says, what? (laughs) Can a grown man, can I or anyone else go back into the womb? And Jesus was again speaking spiritually. Nicodemus is thinking literally. A third example that we know well is where Jesus said in John 2, 19 and 20, he says, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. Jesus is up here speaking at this level. People were down here. The Jews said it's taken 46 years to build this temple. And will you raise it in three days? Now, when I say 46 years, this is hundreds of people working on the temple. 46 years. Jesus says, I'll raise it back up. You know, destroy it. I'll raise it up in three days. And that, those meeting of the minds did not occur. John 2 explains this to us. It says, but he, Jesus, was speaking of the temple of his body. Therefore, when he had risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this to them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. And so this issue of failing to distinguish between the spiritual and literal interpretation of God's word was very important back in those days and it's still important in our days and it is still happening up here down here even in today's society in in the Christian church Christians have problem reading God's word and applying a spiritual interpretation to it Thinking literally instead of spiritually does not work any more today than it did in the days of Jesus' earthly ministry. That thinking error leads to many wrong interpretations of Scripture, resulting in a plethora of Christian denominations. Scriptural misinterpretation has been and is a huge problem resulting in all these different beliefs that we see up and down the road, different churches, different signs as to what they believe. In all three of these important discourses that we've just briefly covered, we see again that Jesus is speaking spiritually. People are thinking literally. Literal things, these things that they were thinking about, are actually symbols of what Jesus was talking about. And so you have to understand this interconnection, which is the symbols, what they represent. Now, we're going to get deeper and deeper and deeper. We're going to ponder anew in just a minute temples in the Bible. We're going to talk about temples for just a couple moments. Temples are part of the title of the sermon today, Soul Temple, remember that? And it's a vital part of God's plan of salvation. Even though you don't see that term in the Bible, the term is in the Bible as far as the concept. In fact, it's very important. God told Moses after delivering his people from Egypt in uh, Exodus 25, 8, It says, and let them make me a sanctuary, a sacred place that I may what? Dwell among them. And so God gave Moses some very detailed uh, instructions about how the Israelites were to build the sanctuary in the wilderness, how they were to build some furniture to go in that sanctuary. And also he gave instructions about the priest's clothing that was to be worn. Those are some things to keep in the back of your little mind there. Your big mind, I'm sorry. (laughs) My little mind. The furniture, of course, was the Ark of the Covenant. had the Ten Commandments, the the manna in it, um, Aaron's rod and everything. The table of showbread, the golden candlesticks, or the menorah and the golden altar. All these furniture items were in there. And so after settling in the promised land, we have this great permanent temple built that is often called Solomon's Temple. Solomon's Temple was a grand building, but it was destroyed, unfortunately, by King Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians in 586. When we've studied prophecy, that's a number, that's a year that uh, is a starting place for a completely different sermon. King Cyrus and the Persian Empire allowed the Jews to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild a second temple, which was later enhanced by King Herod, and it became known as Herod's Temple. 
This is the temple that was actually in existence when Jesus was on this earth. And, but this temple, too, was destroyed by the Romans in 70 A.D. And we've, uh, again, you're touching into edge of prophecies when we, we talk about the destruction of the temple and things of that nature. The modern nation of Israel was established. Most of you can't remember back this far, but I can't quite, but I can almost. It was established in 1948. Many Orthodox Jews and Christians have been making efforts and plans to build a third temple. You see, they believe in the literal prophecies in the Bible, such as Jeremiah 33. They further believe that the third temple must be rebuilt before the world can actually be redeemed. They've been raising money to do so and have also already actually built the furniture to go in that temple pretty impressive however there's one little problem actually there's one big problem there is an islamic shrine that you've probably seen before called the dome of the rock standing on the temple site which is considered holy by muslims islam you've never seen such a fight as there would be if the dome of the rock was torn down or destroyed although it was destroyed in an earthquake or severely damaged in the year 1000, 1015 and then it was rebuilt. There's an article in the Jew, it's a publication called The Jewish Voice that's very interesting to read, and we don't have time to get into it, but it talks about all the efforts uh, and the attempts and the drive and the initiative to rebuild the Third Temple. Um, we have a picture here. This is the uh, Islamic Dome of the Rock. And that golden dome there is uh, what we're talking about in the middle. And this is the, on the site where the first temple and the second temple were built. And in the foreground, this is a picture Jonathan actually uh, took when he was uh, over there. The, the wall that you see in the front there in the foreground is called the Western Wall or the Wailing Wall. And that's where you see lots of people go to that wall and... and uh, and pray and stick little pieces of paper in the cracks. And uh, they, 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 you know, that's a very holy place for them. The Soul Temple. We briefly covered the uh, physical wilderness uh, sanctuary. We've talked about Solomon's Temple. We've talked about Herod's Temple. And we've talked about the attempt to build even a third temple. But Jesus brought a new phase of his ministry into the plan of salvation when he left the throne of heaven and came down to this earth. He did not come to set up another kingdom. He did not come to rebuild a third temple. Jesus came to offer himself as an atoning sacrifice for us, for me and you and this entire world. And you recall how the temple veil was torn when Jesus died at, uh, on the cross, symbolizing the end of the sacrificial system. And we're going to study some texts now. This is where we're going to have to ponder with capital, all capital letters, ponder. The texts we'll be reading today are texts that you've likely read a number of times in the past, but they are still some hard texts for us to comprehend because these are texts from God up here. And we're thinking down here. And we try to think up there, but it's, it's, it's a stretch sometimes for us to think spiritually. And so I personally wrestle to fully understand these texts, but these are texts that we really need to meditate on and thoughtfully study in order to more fully understand them. We can be like the Ethiopian eunuch. You remember he was riding down the road in his chariot? I don't know if that was like a Cadillac or what, but, you know, in, in his chariot, though. And he was reading the Bible. I guess he must have had a driver or he had this uh, driverless application, maybe, on his chariot. You reckon? You know, <laughs> he might have had Elon Musk, you know, uh, driving. I don't know. Anyway... His chariot was going down the road. He was reading his Bible. He was opening. He was reading the uh, book of Isaiah, and he did not understand it. You remember how God sent uh, a man called what? Philip. 
Philip, remember that? Philip caught up with him. He must have been a fast runner. Or the chariot was going slow. I'm not sure which. Maybe a combination. But God sent Philip to uh, this Ethiopian eunuch. And Philip caught up with him, was talking with him. And the Ethiopian eunuch said, uh, I don't understand this. And Philip explained it to him. He accepted it right there. They were close to a body of water. And the Ethiopian eunuch says, I want to be baptized. Oh, isn't that neat? He didn't go through 27 lessons, did he, or anything. But he was a man of God. You know, he was willing to go and follow God instantly. And so that's, uh, that's, that's a witness for us. Now we're going to look at some texts here. These are the texts that we quote what we want to do. Ponder. Think about. Deeply think about. 1 Corinthians 2, 13, 14. These things we also speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches. That don't put you on guard right there. But which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. And we're going to apply this to some text here. We're going to look at some spiritual interpretations instead of the literal. Again, the spiritual things are much deeper. And so we need to put all of our mental faculties into meditating on what God wants us to understand here. He didn't put things in the scriptures just to confuse us, did he? He put them there for our blessing. Luke 17, 20. It says, Now when he, Jesus, was asked by the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God would come, he, that is Jesus, answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. That is, you aren't going to see it coming. It's not going to say, you know, it's coming out here or anything like that. Nor will they say, see here or see there. For indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. So that's the heavy part. The kingdom of God is within you. In other words, Jesus was telling the disciples, and again, this is their tradition. They were looking for an earthly Messiah. They wanted to defeat the Romans, drive them out, and, and be free again. And Jesus was saying, not happening right now. It's going to happen in the future. Jesus is coming again, but not now. They were wanting to be delivered Jesus instead taught about a spiritual kingdom and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit within our hearts, which that's, that's just heavy for us to understand. Jesus did not come to fight the Romans, but to continue to wage spiritual warfare against Satan. Ephesians 6, 12. It says, For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, that is, contending only with physical opponents, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly or supernatural places. And we're going to look at another text here, 1 Corinthians 3, 16. God says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God? If you want to look at it, maybe you're the third temple. You know, God, <laughs> just keep that thought in mind. Ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Don't you know that? You know, it's what God, it's a question here. And so here in, and in other texts, Jesus is teaching the ultimate, listen to that now, the ultimate meaning of the word temple. And he's placing an emphasis on the spiritual not the literal. God's people now make up the temple of God on earth. You and I are part of the temple. We might be a little block or brick or something, but we're part of the temple. I mean, we're, we're trying to make that connection there. All of the faithful believers make up God's temple on earth now. Is that an awesome or humbling thought? It's just awesome though. It's not just some little, well, it's not a little building. It's not some building in the Middle East in Jerusalem that we saw a picture of a while ago. God's temple is not that, folks. It's all throughout. God's temple is throughout the entire world. But this is not hard, easy for us to comprehend, even more than virgin birth is. You know, 
how did God come down and, uh, you know, blows our little mind. Blows mine, at least. How can we be born again? Blows my little mind. And so let's read some more text about this amazing truth that God has revealed to us that requires a lot of pondering. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. It says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God? And you are not your own, for you were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. 2 Corinthians 6, 16. For you, or we might say we, are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. The word dwell here, I want to stop for just a second. If you have somebody one to come to your house and dwells with you, is that a Sunday afternoon or Sabbath afternoon or Tuesday afternoon visit? No. Dwelling indicates a more permanent relationship, doesn't it? It's dwelling, living with. It's not a one day, it's not a Sabbath thing, it's a seven day thing. Dwelling. You and I, again, do not need to go halfway around the world to visit a temple in Jerusalem to worship. God is within us, which is the meaning of the name of one of the titles of Jesus, Emmanuel, or God with us. Ephesians 2.19 says, Now therefore you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fit together grows into a holy temple to the Lord and also which you are being built together for a, what's that next word? Dwelling place of God in the spirit. And so we have some just precious, precious insights into the God's plan for the soul temple. Here, read the, this is something from the Zara of Ages here, which this is gold, gold, precious. From eternal ages, it was God's purpose. Now, this is something you're going to have to ponder, 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 ponder. Listen to this, though, but it just starts to fit together here. From eternal ages, it was God's purpose. How long now? Eternal ages. Not, not just, you know, since this earth was created or anything. It's God's eternal purpose. Uh, purpose from the eternal ages it was God's purpose that every created being from the bright and holy seraph that is angels you know, to man should be a temple for the indwelling of the creator now if there, there's not a sentence that that's one of the most powerful sentences that we can comprehend right there because of sin, humanity ceased to be a temple for God. Darkened and defiled by evil, the heart of man no longer revealed the glory of the divine one. But I like word but sometimes when you have some negative news, it's a but. It means we've got good news. But by the incarnation of the Son of God, the purpose of heaven is fulfilled. God dwells in humanity. And through saving grace, the heart of man, listen, the heart of man becomes again his temple. Wow. It's restoration, folks, to God's original purpose. Let's continue here. It's another uh, quote from the Tsar of Ages. God, and th this is pondering stuff too. God designed that the temple at Jerusalem, we, we, we studied a little, we just just a little snippets of it, that the temple at Jerusalem should be a continual witness to the high destiny open to every soul. But the Jews had not understood the significance of the building. They were saying, boy, boy, what a beautiful building. You know, we've got a beautiful sanctuary here. But that's not the purpose of the building, is it? The beauty is within the hearts of me and you and all the people that follow the Lord. But the Jews had not understood the significance of the building, though, you know, it was beautiful building. They regarded with so much pride. Well, I hope we don't have any pride like this. 
We want to look at the hearts here. They did not yield themselves as holy temples for the divine spirit. The courts of the temple at Jerusalem filled with tumult of unholy traffic. Represented. See, Jesus applies these things in the New Testament and uh, the, the things like this. They represent other things, spiritual things. All this traffic, you know, remember Jesus turning over the uh, money changers and running the people out and they had all the bleeding sheep and they're trading and selling and uh, all that stuff. Jesus said that that represents all too truly the temple of the heart. In cleansing the temple from the world's buyers and sellers, Jesus announced his mission to cleanse the heart from the defilement of sin, from the selfish lust, the evil habits that corrupt the soul, or his, we might say his temple. You see, Jesus' cleansing of the temple is just not a history lesson. Jesus cleansed the temple. He wants to cleanse my heart and your heart. We have impure, sinful hearts. And yet when we repent and ask God to forgive, he is more willing to forgive and cleanse us than we can imagine. He wants to dwell within a pure and holy heart and mind. I have another slide here. It says, No man can of himself cast out the evil throng that have taken possession of the heart. Now th think of the physical temple and all the money changers and all that stuff that's going on, all the extortion and taking advantage of. That was a literal. But Jesus is talking about heart here. He says, no man of himself or can of himself cast out the evil throng that have taken possession of the heart. Only Christ can cleanse the soul temple. Ah. But he will not force an entrance. The Lord is more willing to give the Holy Spirit to those who serve him than parents are to give good gifts to their children, Acts of the Apostles. Jesus says in Revelation 3.20, says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Now, the Jews and sometimes some other people would visualize Jesus coming to that door over there and knock, 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 right? But Jesus is right, and he's knocking on this door right here. He's knocking on this door. Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. He will dwell with us. To me, that's a very humbling thought that Jesus would want to come in, into you know, my heart and into your heart for the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Jesus seeks to save us but he does not force himself into that door. He's not going to knock the door down with a battering ram. He's going to knock. It's just another aspect of how God loves us with his immeasurable love that's so hard for us to understand. What a mighty God we serve. Revelation 5.10, it says, And have made us kings and, or a kingdom and priests to our God. You ever think of yourself being a king or ladies of queens, I guess? <laughs> you know, they, they use the word generically here. But you're, you are royalty because you belong, you are a, are a child of the king of kings. You are a child of the king of kings. You are royalty because Jesus has claimed us. He's redeemed us. He created us. In conclusion, I have a quote here to share with you. It says, through Christ was to be fulfilled the purpose, this is a pondering thing, was to be fulfilled the purpose of which the tabernacle was a symbol. It was not an end, it was a symbol. That glorious building, its walls of glistening gold reflecting in rainbow hues, the curtains inwrought with cherubim, the fragrance of ever-burning incense pervading all, the priest robed in spotless white, and in the deep mystery of the inner place, above the mercy seat, between the figures of the bowed worshiping angels, the glory of the holiest. And then listen to this, in all, God desired his people to read his purpose for the human soul.
It was the same purpose long afterwards set forth by the Apostle Paul speaking by the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, he shall God, or him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. You see, God's everlasting plan is to dwell within our hearts and the hearts and the minds of all his created beings throughout the universe. God's presence is what makes us holy. And that's important. We are not going to make ourselves holy, no matter if we have a long checklist here. I've done that, I've done that, I've done that, I've done that. That does not make us holy. It may make us obedient, it does not make us holy. God makes us holy. His presence makes us holy. The temple was to be a representation of what God wants our hearts and minds to be. He wants us to forgive as he forgave. He wants us to love truth and mercy. You see all these, think about the, what was in the, associated with the temple. He wants us to, uh, again, love truth and mercy in the mercy seat there. He wants us to, to write his moral law, the Ten Commandments, on our hearts. Remember that? It's not just in the side of some, uh, a, a cabinet or article of furniture. He wants us to be the light of the world. He wants us to partake of the bread of life and drink the living waters. He wants us to wear his robe of righteousness that he supplied. He wants the incense of our prayers to ascend to heaven. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Let's bow our heads. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And dear Lord, I pray that the text and Bible text and your word that we've studied today help us to be able to ponder these things help us to live in accordance with thy will give us understanding dear Lord help us to be faithful help us to be obedient help us to cherish the things of God of, of love and mercy and, and justice and all the things that you want to have within our hearts dear Lord Cleanse our hearts from all unrighteousness. Give us the robe of righteousness that Jesus has provided, dear Lord. And pray that you will just guide us and, again, give us understanding of your will for us. Help us to be faithful to the very end. Help us to encourage one another as we go through uh, the sinful life that's on this earth. And we look forward, to, dear Lord, to your second visible, literal coming when the dead in Christ which shall rise, and we which are living will be caught up in the air to meet him, to meet Jesus in the air. Help us, dear Lord. Bless us, cleanse us, and help us to be holy, your holiness in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name.